All right, let's get on with part two of networking. So, um, so we've explained a bunch of stuff so far, and, and just in the end of part one there, we were talking about peer-to-peer -peer games and the fact that it can be difficult to get to synchronize, but you can maybe do it with lock stepping, or you can maybe do it with buffered input or something. But to be honest, there's only so much you can do. It turns out that maintaining consistency on a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology, that's where everyone sends the messages to everyone else, ends up being hard, and ultimately it's, it's, it's hard to make it consistent. Um, the general solution to that, which has been popular for quite a long time now, is to have authoritative servers instead. So you don't do peer-to-peer, -peer, you do client-server. right? So the idea with client-server is that you have one machine that you say, you are the, you are the one source of truth. That machine decides what happens really, and all the other machines have got kind of, you know, uh, delayed, approximate versions of that. Ultimately, the server decides. So the server decides who wins. The server decides, you know, who gets killed when somebody gets shot, and the other machines just get told what to do. Basically, that's the idea there. Because um, among the problems with peer to peer, you know, there's this thing: it's hard to get them in sync. It's also hard to make them secure. Because uh, if you've got a peer-to-peer -peer system where what people do is, you know, like you, you compute your own local position and then you tell other people where you are, so that, well, a hacker could easily get in there and tell other people lies. So you could create, you know, you could modify your program to tell other people that you were moving faster than you really were. Uh, you could just cheat horribly. Um, so that's a, another downside of peer-to-peer. -peer. And that's why a lot of things move to the client-server model. Um, so yeah, you have one machine that's in charge, and that way the, the question about divergence kind of goes away in that you still have to make sure that the other machines are kind of in sync with the server, but there's no ambiguity about who won. You know, who, who won is who the server says won, and then it can just tell people who the victor was, and that way you get, you get agreement. Um, in the simplest version of this system, the clients can actually be entirely dumb, so all the client does is it would you know, send its key presses up to the server, the server would compute all the game logic for everyone, and then just send back uh, information about positions and stuff like that, so the clients would just render the world. Uh, they would be, you know, fairly dumb in that sense. Um, in practice, the clients are made smarter than that. I'll explain why in a bit. But in, in principle, the client could be quite inert. It would just send positional information. Um, so, client-server model is often used, uh, especially in games where the players are kind of very spread out uh, and where. Uh, no individual client knows enough about the world to simulate the whole thing. So, for example, in games with a large number of players, that's what you do, because you couldn't really have each client you know, simulating the whole world everywhere. It's too much. Um, what you do is you, you make the server simulate the whole world, because it's usually a more powerful machine. And also, if the server is a dedicated machine that no one's playing on it, it's just the server, that means it doesn't need to render things. So what you often do is you have a machine that's acting as the server. It's not having to spend resources rendering stuff, so it can spend all of its time computing stuff instead. So, for example, you know, big kind of uh, MMO games, that's the way they work. They've got a server somewhere that's just computing what's happening in the world. It doesn't have to draw anything. Um, so it can simulate the whole map, and it just sends out uh, subsets of information to the clients telling you about the things that are near you, and then you just render the things that are near you. Okay, so that's uh, so. What was the kind of division of labour? Each client just needs to know what's part happening in its local neighbourhood, but the server has to kind of figure out everything. Um, but because the clients don't have information about the full state of the world on a client-server game, it means that you can't do that thing about just sending the control inputs because the clients don't know enough about the world to work, work out the consequences of that. So you have to send states instead. If the clients have only got partial information. Uh, you need to tell them things like, oh, this guy just appeared and he's traveling at this velocity and stuff, because the client would have no way of working that out um, because it doesn't know everything. So you send states instead. Um, the problem with that is that potentially sending states is uh, more expensive than just sending inputs. So if you just send control inputs, it's very small amount of bandwidth. You know, it's just you know, press the key, let go of the key, tiny, tiny amounts of data. Whereas um, if you're in an environment with a lot of people doing stuff, you might have like you know dozens or hundreds of objects whose states having to be updated all the time. So it does take more bandwidth to send states. Um, but what's often done, of course, is you try and reduce it to the set of relevant entities. So you only send people the information about the things that are near them. And in fact, sometimes what you do is uh, you do it by degrees. So things that are very close to you get sent with high frequency updates, and things that are in the mid distance you send them at lower frequency updates. 
and then maybe things on the horizon you send them only very rarely and other things not at all so you, you can kind of control the frequency based on what's relevant to each player uh, another thing is that you can also send deltas uh, which means that it can that can reduce the cost of sending these state updates because you actually send the differences from one state to the next and that helps a little bit uh, so client server is, is often good and is kind of like probably the default way of doing a network game nowadays, but it does have downsides. Um, one of the, the most obvious problems is that whenever you send something client server, um, it has to go a two-way trip. You know, anything you send has to go from the client to the server to another client, so kind of up and down connection. Whereas in peer to peer, you could have sent it directly, which might have been better. So actually, in a sense, you can actually make latency worse with client server because it's having to bounce to a central hub and back out again. Um, but usually that's just something we've decided to accept. So it's maybe slightly more latency, but it's a much more manageable system because peer-to-peer -peer becomes chaotic. Uh, you can also get unfairness in client server games because of that. Like you might have a player who is very close to the server, so they've got very low latency, which means they get quick feedback on their actions, and that's an advantage. In fact, the extreme version is someone who's playing on the server machine. You can sometimes do that, that the server is just one of the people playing the game, uh, and therefore they've got like you know zero latency. Um, and even if you've got a dedicated server, someone will be closer to the server than other people, and they have an advantage. And people gripe about this all the time, of course. Um, you know, but not not a lot you can do about that. Um, you could actually try and do things like you could measure the overall latency and try and slow down the people that had low latencies to make make it fair. You could kind of buffer them a little bit, so you could try and make everyone have sort of the same. But I don't think people do that very much. Um, so yeah, there's, there's potential a bit of unfairness with client server that someone is maybe going to have an advantage. Um, and the other problem, the big other big problem with client server is because the server is doing all of the logical computation. You don't have a distributed simulation anymore. You've got centralized simulation with a bunch of leeches kind of hanging off it, and now you've got a single point of failure. If the server goes down, your whole game's down. Um, so that's another downside of this approach. Because in theory, in a peer-to-peer -peer system, if you do it right and one of the peers disconnects, the others could sort of keep going if you've if you've designed it to accommodate that. But if your server goes down, there's no hope. Uh, the game's over. So although I said that um, clients can potentially be dumb in a network game, and in practice they often aren't, because what you want to do is you want to, uh, you've still got the latency problem. So one of the things you can do to uh, reduce the apparent effects of latency is when you do something on the client, instead of sending that message to the server and waiting for it to compute the results and sending it back, which you know basically you have to wait 80 milliseconds before the server says, yeah, you're allowed to move, and you can feel that as many frames. So you've, you've pressed a key, and it's many frames before you actually start moving. So what we sometimes do is, when you press the key locally, the client basically predicts what's, what's going to happen. So it allows you to immediately start moving locally, so it feels responsive, but actually it hasn't really happened until it gets to the server. So it means that locally, you're actually using a slightly predicted version of the future, which just makes it feel responsive to you, even though actually what's really happening is is, a, is tens of milliseconds behind. So that's basically uh, that's the trick. Uh, so clients can make local predictions about things, um, and that makes it look as if the latency is not as large as it really is. So you can, you know, when you when you jump, it just starts jumping locally on the client, and then behind the scenes, you're telling the server that you're going to jump, and it really decides if you jump, and it it's, it's the truth but you've got this kind of anticipated version of the future that you use. But there's a problem there, of course, is that you know the client is not authoritative. It's not really allowed to decide things like this. So sometimes when you do prediction, the client predicts things that don't happen, but the client might predict that you're going to do the jump, but by the time it gets to the server, it turns out there's a, there's a moving platform is above you or something like that, so the jump doesn't actually happen, and then it has to send a message back to you saying, no, the jump didn't work. And then that, that correction arrives, and that's going to look weird on the client because suddenly you know you were doing something, and suddenly you jumped to some other location, which I'm sure you've seen, and that's because the server has corrected a prediction that you made that uh, wasn't 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 true. Uh, so that's a problem there. Uh, and the other problem is that it's very hard to predict other players in a game to the point where we, we don't usually try. So that means that your local behavior you can predict because you press the keys. You know you. 
you, you know what you're, you're going to try and do. So you can predict yourself, but you can't really predict your enemies. It's too hard if you, you, you get it wrong more often than right. So the other players tend to be lagged because you have to wait for the server to tell you what they're doing. So the problem is you're kind of got two time streams. Like your own time stream is taking place slightly in the, an estimated future, and all the other people are actually slightly in the past. So that's why sometimes, again, when you shoot someone and again they don't die, it's because you know they weren't really where you thought they were, and now, and you weren't where you thought you were either, right? You know, it's like your position is a bit wrong and his position is a bit wrong. So guess what? If you get a, you know you do a very kind of targeted like laser sighting on someone, there's a perfectly good chance that when it gets to the server, that that wasn't a hit. Because prediction is difficult, especially about oh, le difficult lemon difficult, especially about the future. Yeah. Um, there we go. Uh, so you can get these kind of weird time warp effects uh, when you do a client side prediction, and it's something you have to be aware of if you're writing a network game. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I said uh, already. I think that's a false alarm just because I. Stop talking for a second. Right, so the problem with predictions is that by their nature, they're not always accurate. And you have to, so if you're writing a game where you use client side prediction, which remember you do to hide latency, the downside is you also have to deal with the consequence of your prediction being wrong sometimes. Um, and what happens when you're wrong is that the server corrects you and then you have to either like snap to a new position, but that's kind of ugly. So what you sometimes try and do is instead of snapping to the corrected position when you've made a mistake, you try and blend towards that position instead. Right? So that's sometimes done. Um, so you don't want to have like these kind of jumping corrections. Uh, so what you do is when the server sends you a correction and says, no, actually, you're over here, you have to kind of blend towards that. But it's harder than that because by the time you blend towards it, you know, if the whole point of a blend is instead of just doing like a jump cut to set your position over here, you say, okay, I'm going to blend there. By definition, blending takes time. That's the whole point. You don't want to do it instantly. So it takes time. So by the time you've got there, you're not there anymore. So what you actually have to do is you take the server's correction and you have to extrapolate it forward based on what it tells you, and then you blend towards that instead. So it's really complicated. So you end up being on this kind of constant game of making local predictions and having the server tell you what actually happened, and then you have to kind of guess ahead of the server and then blend towards that, and then it'll correct you again. So you're, you're always kind of doing these weird blending operations, which can indeed be lemon difficult. I've had to do it a couple of times. It's quite hard. Um, one of the many things that can happen with predictions is that uh, imagine you, you take some action, like you decide to go left or something, and you, you locally you predict, okay, you move left, you sidestepped, but on the server it decided there was a collision, so you didn't actually get to go left. But you don't know that, so you've gone left, and now you jump or something like that. Uh, so you've gone left and you've jumped, and now the server says, no, the going left didn't happen. And it's like, well, not only have I gone left, I've jumped as well. And I did press the jump key, so I will jump, but I won't jump in the position that I thought I jumped in. Right? So what you end up having to do there is you say, okay, I went left and I jumped. The servers just told me, no, the going left didn't happen. And then it's like, okay, so I didn't go left, but I would have done the jump. So now you have to go, you have to kind of like rewind time and say, okay, I need to do the jump again from the other position and then work towards that. So this is the, like the hardest version of this is where locally the client has a buffer of all the predictions that it's made. And when the corrections come in, you have to kind of slightly replay through that to work out all the, the revised consequences. Um, so did I, did I mention it was difficult? Uh, so this is something that you can do where the client has got a buffer of its own local history. And what happens is when you receive a correction back in time, you have to replay your previous actions on top of the server's prediction so that everything just kind of synchronizes or is more synchronized than it would otherwise be. Um, the other big killer with predictions is that because they can be wrong and they can they can get revoked, um, you basically you can't predict things that are impossible to undo. For example, you don't want to predict like killing someone because imagine if locally you say, "Ah, oh, look, I think he's in my sights. I've killed him," and you predict it, and it turns out it was wrong. It's like, what's going to happen? Well, the guy's going to die and then come back to life, right? And it's like that's that's too crap. We can't have that. Or imagine if you predicted picking something up. 
what you picked up a health pack and locally you say, oh, great, I picked it up and you give yourself a health boost. And then the service says, no, you didn't pick it up. It wasn't where you thought it was. Somebody else got there before you. And then it's like, what, I now have to take the health back off me. So it turns out there are some things in the game where because you know that undoing them would be like really awkward, you don't predict those things at all. So usually you won't predict picking up an object because it's too embarrassing to undo that uh, if it turned out you made a mistake. And likewise, it's too embarrassing to kill someone and then have them come back to life. So you don't. So those things are lagged. So it means if you, you run over a pickup, you maybe predict running over it and maybe you get it right. Maybe you don't. But you, the actual pickup effect will happen a little bit after you've run past it because you have to wait for the server to check that, yeah, you really did pick it up. So you get this mixture of some things are predicted and some things aren't. The basic rule being that you only predict things that you can kind of uh, correct in the event that you turned out to have got them wrong. Okay. So, uh, so the biggest type of network game with the most people and in some ways the most complexity are the massively multiplayer online games. Uh, and they, they add a whole bunch of extra crap uh, to the mix. Um, they basically just take most of the standard networking problems and, and exaggerate them. For example, often it's a global player base. Often you've got very large numbers of players in the, in the environments. Um, so all these latency problems get amplified. It, it, just, it just exaggerates a lot of the standard problems. Um, but the way MMOs work is that they're generally client server based. Uh, with the server being authoritative over things for lots of reasons. Um, one of them is, is you know, so you can't uh, to so you can't hack. Uh, you know, you can't trust the clients because the clients could be hacked. So you can really only trust the server. So you need to have a central server. Also, the business model kind of depends on the central server because what you're paying for is access to the server. You know, often they don't uh, MMOs don't really care if you copy the client. Uh, they, they don't want you to copy the server, though. They want you to make sure that you're, you're paying to get access to the server. So that's how it's all kind of built around a, a server architecture. Um, but that does create a lot of centralization. You know, if you have an MMO with tens of thousands of players, that's a lot of load to put on one server. Um, and in fact, what we think of as servers are often not single computers because of that. Like a single computer couldn't actually support tens of thousands of players. So a lot of online servers, you know, they're, they're described as a server, but they're actually often made of multiple computers that are uh, collaborating. Um, that's for an MMO. Yeah, the other big problem with MMOs is that um, the, any kind of per player costs um, that don't matter so much with, with, like, if you only got, like, you know, 10, 20 players in a game, like a 16 player, you know, shooting game or something, it doesn't really matter if there are some per-player overheads. Depends what they are, of course. But if you start scaling up to hundreds and thousands of players, any of those costs start to become big. You know, even a fraction of a millisecond when you're multiplying it by a thousand players, it's a lot, right? So you have to be, just be very careful about your CPU usage, even your memory usage uh, for individual players. It just forces you to be very efficient about certain things. And that's one of the reasons why MMOs are simplified. Like you'll notice the you know the animation systems on MMOs are not as good as they are on you know, kind of uh, first-person single-player games. And that's just because, you know, they could do it, but it takes a couple of milliseconds to do a good animation system, uh, you know, to do the computations for it. And, you, you know, if you do, do that times a 1,000 players, you're already below one frame a second, right? Uh, so that's why you kind of have to keep them simple. Um, it's particularly bad if you've not just got a per player cost, but something that scales worse than linearly, that you've got like an N squared thing. You know, you've got a thing where at some point a player has to check against every other player. Uh, imagine what happens there, right? You've got thousands of players. It scales to millions. It gets really, really slow. So you have to be really careful about all that kind of complexity stuff. So when you're doing like an engine for an MMO, you really have to look for any of those things, even little fairly small N squared inefficiencies that don't really matter when you've only got three or four players. They, they all start to matter and you really have to spend a lot of time on them. So you end up having to really optimize things like collision detection and object relevancy calculations um, because they become real bottlenecks. Uh, so indeed, I had to do that with APB. You know, we had to do a lot of work to make the spatial data structures efficient. I mentioned that in the, the, the collision lecture. It turned out for us the best way to do it was to have a, a fairly simple boxed grid system that was actually faster than an alt tree for our purposes. But it, you know, it, it was quite. It's still a lot of work to identify all that and, and get it to, to work well. 
Um, so the other big thing MMOs do to try and deal with scaling is, of course, they shard. Uh, they all know what I mean by sharding. Maybe not. Okay, so the idea is that um, you have something like you know, World of Warcraft. It kind of presents itself to the players as if it's, as if it's one big world, but actually it's not uh, because they couldn't support having you know tens of thousands of players all literally on one server. Uh, so what they do is they create parallel copies of the world, and when you come in, you get put on one of them. So you know you're there with maybe you know several hundred other people, but you're not there with the thousands of other people who are actually all on different instances. So those instances are called shards. So they're just copies of the world. But the problem is that with that, if you come on, you know, you and your friend might not be in the same shard. So you could go to the same place and you wouldn't see each other. Um, although sometimes games have a mechanism where you can say, you know, I'm friends with him, so please put us in the same shard if you can. But it doesn't always happen. Uh, so yeah, sharding is one of the ways that you can uh, deal with having more players than you could you could otherwise handle. You just create new instances of the map. And that's actually quite easy from a technical point of view. You know, you just make sure you've got another server to run, and when people connect, you just assign them to one or the other. Uh, so a lot of MMOs do it that way. Um, yeah, so you could just buy more computers, or nowadays you rent them. A lot of you know, uh, when I was in Scotland, we had our like our own, we had to have our own data center for our game. But nowadays, you generally what you do is you you rent computers from a cloud provider like Amazon or something like that. And that means if you suddenly get a burst of new players, you just you just request more machines from Amazon, and you just get them. Yeah. So uh, so sharding is a fairly easy way to deal with having more players in your system, but it's kind of a cheat because you split up the player player base into these little islands, and you know you tell you tell people, oh, we've got thousands of simultaneous players. Actually, you, you can only ever see a hundred because you, you know your shards only ever got a hundred people in it. So it's a little bit of a con, but that's what's often done. Um, and the APB, the thing that I worked on, uh, was a little bit like that. You know, we could support, you know, potentially however many players uh, wanted to play, but individual shards would have a limit of like you know 250 people in them, which actually turned out to be okay for gameplay reasons. Like we didn't want, you know, if you've got like a little, you know, one k by one k. Uh, city environment. You don't actually want to have like, thousands of players in there all shooting each other all the time. Uh, so it actually made sense that there would only be a couple of hundred people in each kind of copy of the map and we just created as many copies as we needed to accommodate how many people were actually playing. Uh, but that was quite hard to do because even then supporting like a hundred odd players uh, each of those players had, had unique customized meshes and everything, so you weren't even rendering the same mesh. You were you had custom textures, and they all had vehicles and all this kind of thing. So it was quite hard to get that to work, but we managed it. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the thing we had to do. We had to get rid of the the alt tree and uh, improve some other things. Uh, unfortunately, AP was not an enormous success, uh, which is part of the reason I ended up being here. But that's that's. Uh, for unrelated reasons, I think technically it was quite good. Uh, it just didn't didn't hit on uh, on on every uh, every relevant aspect. Uh, and then finally, we come to Eve Online, another MMO case study. How many of you played Eve? Only one. Okay, oh, interesting. Um, but I mean, I think you know what it is, don't you? You know, just a big MMO space game. So that's the idea. Um, Eve has theoretically got like you know maybe half a million accounts of people who play it. And simultaneous users are maybe in the order of like many tens of thousands. Um, numbers vary depending on what time you're taking them. Um, but the interesting thing about Eve is it's actually all one shard. Um, if like a, you know if two players in Eve both go to the same solar system, they actually really end up on the same computer in the same solar system. They can see each other. It doesn't shard them off. Um, and uh, that's quite a hard thing to pull off. And it's one of the things that's kind of unusual about Eve. Um, so Eve's got a system that I think is, is quite unlike most other online games, and that it really thinks of itself as being a distributed computing cluster. Uh, so the, the universe of Eve is implemented on um, a whole set of machines, you know, dozens of computers that are all working together, uh, and they kind of divide the load between each other. Uh, they try to do that in a sort of fairly sensible way. Um, and the idea is that the whole thing simulates as if it's one consistent universe, but it's actually offloaded into lots of little different discrete parts. So this is sort of how it works. Um, if you're a client in EVE when you're playing on your PC, uh, what happens is that 
you when you connect up, you get connected to a thing called a proxy. You just get assigned kind of randomly to one of these. And the proxy is a kind of like a kind of routing thing that just takes your data and sends it into the main uh, hub of EVE. And the core part of EVE is implemented on these things called SOL servers, which are basically our, you know, our individual machine instances. So we have a whole bunch of machine instances that all talk to a central SQL server, which is the database. This is actually a bit of a limitation because we've got one central database everything funnels into. So this is our kind of single point of failure. And we have to do a lot to keep this machine that, you know, to be super fast. And ideally, what we should do is we should break this database up into sections uh, so that we can scale out a bit more. But at the moment, it's kind of a, a monolithic database with uh, distributed processing units around here. And what tends to happen is if you're doing something on your client, you send messages to the proxy, it routes it to one of the Sol servers that's available to handle your request, and it computes. The, so it's, this idea here is a bunch of clients that all end up talking to this one Sol, let's say. It computes the work for you and updates the database, which is the persistent record of you know who's got how much money and who owns what shift and who's in which part of the universe. The stuff that remains that means persistent after we reboot the system. And so it's the state and the Sols just maintain all the, the action. And the idea is that as, as our system gets busier, we can add more solves to the system, and that allows us to distribute the work over more machines. And that's, that's roughly how it's supposed to work. Um, the other interesting thing about Eve is, you know, I said, you know, what sort of data do you send? Sometimes you send key presses, sometimes you send states. Um, what does Eve send? Well, Eve's strange. It doesn't send user inputs directly to the server, and it doesn't send states either. It doesn't send state deltas. It sends function calls. Uh, when you do something in Eve, like you click a button, you know, to like activate something on your ship, uh, you're calling a function. I mean, that would be true normally, right? You call a function, but the thing is that the function is implemented is implemented remotely. So the the code says call the function to switch on your you know your shield or something like that. But that function is actually implemented in a way that says no, I'm a remote function. So when you call me, I actually take the parameters and package them up into a network packet, and we send those over the internet. And it eventually gets to one of those Sol servers, and it does the work because it's, you know, it knows the true state of the simulation. We know that you haven't hacked the Sol server. You might have hacked your client, but we don't think you can hack our server. We hope. Um, so the idea is that the message gets passed off and is executed as a remote function. So it's a, it's a what you call like a remote method invocation system or a remote function call system, an RPC system, um, which is relatively unusual in games. I think Unreal could do RPCs for some things, but not for the main behavior. Um, so that's the way Eve actually works. Um, there's some immediate downsides to this, though, that if you take a function call and you turn it into a remote function call, well, it introduces a lot of problems, but perhaps the most obvious one is latency. You know, a remote function, like a local function call is going to happen instantaneously, right? Because machines are fast. But if you do it remotely, you're, you're adding like tens of milliseconds, uh, potentially 100 milliseconds, let's say, round trip for it to get to the server, for the server to do the work, and for the results to get sent back to you. And it's like, yeah, if you if you like, press a button on the UI and you have to wait 100 milliseconds for the answer, you don't need 10 frames a second. Now, Eve can be slow sometimes, but it's not usually that slow. So the thing is, how do we get around that? Well, the trick is that when you do an RPC, you don't just you don't just sit and wait for the answer. You have to keep yourself busy while you're waiting for the answer. So the trick about Eve is that uh, when it sets off an RPC, it then goes and tries to do something else while it's waiting for the feedback to come in. Um, so the basic trick is, what do you do while you're waiting? You do something else. Um, but how do you do that? It's like, you know, how do you look, how, how do you encode, say, you know, I'm going to call a function, oh, and then uh, while I'm waiting for that, I'm going to do some other thing. What is that? What do you do? No? Yeah, it is true. Yeah, ultimately it's asynchronous calls. Um, but the, the, the sort of naive thing as you think of is, it, is like it's another thread, you know, that you have to say, like, okay, while I'm waiting for this function to respond, I'm going to execute some other functions on another thread somewhere. But it turns out that literally using threads is not a great idea if you have, like, a very large number of them. And it's not good in Python, which is the language that a lot of Eve is written in. So we actually use something that is a bit like a thread. It's not literally a thread. It's called a tasklet. So what happens in Eve is that when you make a function call, uh, if it's a remote one, we kind of create a tasklet to handle waiting for that function to execute remotely, and then we kind of go about our business and do other stuff in, in the background instead. 
Um, so yes, it's a kind of an asynchronous I/O system. Yeah. So the way we do kind of how you have multiple tasks simultaneously uh, in flight in Eve. So they're a bit like threads, but they're not literally threads because they're not done at the operating system level. They're managed by the application itself. And that's something called a green thread. That's where you basically um, you simulate the idea of having different threads of execution, but actually they're explicitly under the control of your application. Uh, and they, they, are, uh, they're kind of, uh, they have lower overhead than a real thread would. Um, so that's what's going on there. So it's a little bit complicated and unusual, but that's that's the way it does it. Um, so that was the clients to server part. You know, it's function calls on the way up. The server to client part is either response to those functions, so it just sends the, you know when the function gets executed, it sends the data back to you. That's one thing. Or it also sometimes has to send you information about the state of the world, like things like a, a new ship has arrived, or you know somebody's orbiting this planet. Uh, so some of the the server to client traffic is uh, updating the state of things that are real. We call them ballparks internally in the code base. And this is just where the physics simulation tells the clients that objects are moving around in space. So that's the other thing that has to happen. Um, and that's done in a relatively low bandwidth way. You just send uh, a bunch of information like, because the players do things like, you know, they say, I want to orbit this planet or this object. And we just send those instructions as commands to the clients. So then they say, OK, he's orbiting. And then they calculate the orbit locally. And everyone calculates it the same way. So they all agree. Um, so that's how that part gets done. Uh, and because this information is, is kind of critical in maintaining the synchronization of the, the simulation, this is sent over TCP. Um, that's the way we get the reliability. OK, so that's Eve. Uh, so the last thing we need to talk about is a relatively new idea called a cloud gaming. Has anyone heard of cloud gaming? Yeah, OK. So I think you, you, you probably get the idea, but I'll just explain it anyway. Um, so back when we were talking about the, uh, you know, what sort of data do you send? Uh, one of the, the last example I gave, the kind of silly answer was send rendered images. That's what cloud gaming does. Uh, cloud gaming decides to just uh, actually uh, render what the client is supposed to see in a server farm somewhere and just, just send you it like a video stream, uh, which sounds kind of daft at first, but it potentially has some advantages. Uh, yeah. So people are starting to think that, that cloud gaming might work. Uh, the idea here is that, um, that we've got lots of little network capable mobile devices with quite good graphics and stuff, or phones. Um, but they don't have enough power to run kind of high-end games. Right? Um, so the idea is that, well, but you know that your phone is good enough to do streaming video because you've, you've seen YouTube and you've seen Twitch. Right? Uh, so in a sense, in a theory, you could sort of do a game like that where uh, instead of sending like a, a pre a pre-uploaded video stream to you, you actually just render it like immediately live. So you, you render the stuff out on a computer somewhere in the cloud, which is just someone else's computer. Uh, so you render it on someone else's computer and you send that to the players as if it were a video stream instead of sending state information or any of these other things. And so why would you do that? Well, the point is that that allows you to deal with things where the game logic is maybe too complicated to run on the, the client device because you just do all the hard work on the big server machine and then all the client device needs to be able to do is to be able to do video streaming, which a lot of things can do now. Um, it also means you don't have to, when you're making a game, you don't have to make versions for all the different platforms. Like imagine if every client just had a generic app that was a, basically a kind of video streamer. It could stream video and it could send your, your keyboard inputs back up to the cloud. That's a fairly simple program to write. And now it means that when you write your game, you don't have to create an Xbox version and a PlayStation version and an Android version and an iPhone version. Uh, you just create one version of your game that's all running in the cloud. And all you do is that each platform that someone invents, they have to write a, a sort of a player app for that platform, which is a video streamer with some embellishments. So there are some people who think this might be a good idea. Um, so that's the idea, the, the, the goal of the universal client, right? Uh, we'll let you play any game. Uh, and whenever you want to do like an upgrade, it's not a big hassle. You don't have to like wait, you know, 
and several hours to get like a massive patch sent to you or anything like that. It's it just gets uploaded on the the cloud machines get upgraded kind of fairly quickly, and you don't really need to change anything. You just start to see different stuff. So there are maybe some advantages, but there's some disadvantages, right? What's the obvious downside of cloud gaming? It's a lot of data. That's true. Uh, which might be a problem if you've got like a poor bandwidth connection. But as you've seen, a lot of people have now got connections that are good enough to handle streaming video. Wasn't the case long ago, but now it is. A lot of people are on you know good broadband, uh, fiber broadband. Um, the real downside is the latency, though, because it means that you know you, you don't have this prediction stuff anymore from the clients. The clients literally have to send things to the server. It computes them, renders them, sends the picture. By the time all that's happened, you know, 100 milliseconds have passed. So that's a lot of latency to live with. So I think the big problem with cloud gaming is uh, can you tolerate the latency or are there tricks that you can do to work around the latency that don't completely invalidate the whole idea of it being... Because if it's cloud rendered, it's like, what can you do? You know, it's not as if you can... You can't do prediction logic because the whole point is the client is so dumb that it doesn't know anything. It's just drawing pictures. It's just, you know, it's just rendering video. So it's like you can't like locally compute having done a jump or something because you don't have the game logic locally. So it's like, hmm, it's hard to hide the latency. Uh, yeah, so dumb clients with cloud gaming are a bit of a problem because you would have quite noticeable latency effects. Um, and a lot, so a lot of people in the games industry think it's a silly idea. They think cloud gaming is kind of a bust because the latency will, will never be good enough because no matter what we do, speed of light is the speed of light. Um, but other people think it might work. Um, so the idea is that we already know that a lot of devices can handle the video streaming part, uh, which again is a you know that's a was not always the case, but it's true now. Um, and we know that we've got very fast servers that can handle having to render the, the render the stuff on the server and compress that into like a video format, you know, which is a, a lot of work. But there are specialised chips that do that kind of thing, you know, uh, MPEG compression and stuff. Um, so you can do that. So, but latency is, does, you know, does, does seem like the real problem. But you might be able to do a little bit of latency hiding even for cloud games. Uh, the theory here is that, um, that some of the things that are happening in the simulation don't depend on you. Uh, you know, there are other things that are happening in the world. And you can kind of tolerate latency on those things. It's like other people moving about and stuff. It's not great, but you can tolerate it. What you really don't like is latency on your own actions. It's really annoying if you try to like, you know, you try to turn around and the game won't let you turn around until you know 100 milliseconds later because you really feel that as a sluggish response. So the trick would be, is there some way that we could allow you to kind of locally be able to kind of look around uh, in the game uh, and kind of somehow hide the latency there, uh, even though it's actually all coming from a, a video stream? Well. Turns out maybe you can, um, because the local movements that you have, they just tend to be like point of view changes and stuff like that. You know, you kind of turn your head a little bit. So imagine if the server sent you an image that was just a little bit bigger, a bigger field of view than you've actually got, and when it arrived, uh, you know, so it arrives a little bit late, and you say, but if you've turned your head by the time it arrives, you just kind of pan to a different part of the image. So basically, you can you can have a little bit of head movement done at the very end locally. Uh, that doesn't that kind of kind of hides the laser. So the picture you get sent is a picture of the world as it was 100 milliseconds ago. But if you can kind of warp it to the way you actually moved your head most recently, you might be able to hide the apparent latency of your own movements. Hope I've explained that well. It's a little bit tricky. Um, uh, so this is actually a thing that's, that's done. It's called time warping, and it's actually particularly done in VR uh, because this problem applies in VR anyway. Like when you're doing, if you've got a head-mounted display and you try and move then what happens is there are sensors that work out your positional change, and then it goes and renders the scene. It used to be that you'd render it on a PC, and then it would be sent back to you, although the things like the, the Oculus Quest, it all happens on board one machine. But the point is, you move your head, and you compute a scene, and you draw something. By the time that image gets back to you, you've moved your head even more. Uh, and if you draw the scene as it was, like, you know, even, even 10 milliseconds before, once you've moved, you're going to feel dizzy, right? Because it's like, you, you move your head here, but you've been shown the image of over here, and everyone's going to swim and be horrible. And it's one of the things that makes people sick in VR. So one of the things they did with VR is they did do this trick where uh, what happens is they render the image, and they render it a bit bigger than it needs to be. And then when it arrives, they look at your head position, like your head position right now, and they do a last-minute little switch of the image 
to compensate for the movements that you made uh, after the frame was rendered. So we actually can do this. Um, so uh, there's a little bit of a video here that explains it. You can maybe look at it yourself if you want. It's too long for me to show it to you, but it, it tries to uh, it tries to explain this idea of basically uh, rendering rendering a frame and then rewarping it at the last minute to deal with the fact that you've moved your head since the point where it, it started started drawing the frame, and it compensates quite well. And it turns out actually it does indeed work in practice. And this is one of the reasons that if you play modern VR games. Um, it's not it's not as bad as it used to be. But then you, have any you played VR recently? And are you enjoying it? You think it's good? Yeah, I'm I'm quite keen on VR, and I think the tech's getting better. And this is one of the tricks that they're doing to make it work. So the same technique that, that is used to hide latency in VR could potentially be used to hide latency for cloud gaming too. Um, so that's basically the trick. Uh, in order for this to really work. Uh, so there's a simple version of this where all you would do is the head movement would be like a pan. You know, it would just kind of slide the image. But in reality, there's depth information as well. So what you really want to do is if the image has got the depth buffer information, that allows you to do a more intelligent kind of distortion of the image that allows you to deal with like relative depth of objects as well. Um, so if you also render the scene's depth information, the so-called Z buffer, um, then it turns out you can do this kind of last minute distortion pass where you correct for the head movement that's happened since the frame started, and you can just fix it all up, and it's pretty good. Uh, in fact, one of the people who worked on this was John Carmack of uh, Quake fame, um, and he was very keen on coming up with ways to try and hide latency, initially for VR, um, and that's something that's come to pass. The other thing I'll mention is that this, Carmack did this work when he was at Oculus, uh, which of course is now part of Meta, as Facebook rebranded itself, and one of the, if you actually listen to Carmack's most recent uh, speech at the, you know, the the Connect Summit or whatever it was, um, he's suggesting that some people think that one of the problems with the metaverse idea that they're trying to do is uh, just now, if you have like a multiplayer experiences in VR, you can't have many players in it, in part because those the headsets are not really that great at rendering lots of people. That's why the avatars are so simple looking. You know, they're not photorealistic. But also, when it looks like they can't render more than a dozen of them or something. And of course, the whole point of the metaverse is supposed to have like, you know, hundreds of people. So the problem is that these little dinky things that you can fit on your face are not going to be powerful enough to do super good graphics. So one of the suggestions is that the way they're maybe going to do the metaverse is they're going to render it in the cloud. So they can run it on like big, fuck off, NVIDIA super GPUs uh, that you couldn't fit on your face. They'd be too big and hot and expensive for it. So they render it in the cloud, they send it down to your uh, your VR thing, and your VR thing just does that time warping trick. You know, it takes your local head position and uses that to, to kind of uh, modify the image that was pre-rendered for you so that it looks okay locally. So there's been some suggestion that's one of the ways they might try and build out those kind of systems. That way you'll be able to have higher quality graphics than the headsets could render themselves because they're basically, you know, they're getting the cloud to render it for them, and they just do the fix-ups at the end. So this is like this is live stuff that they're thinking about. It might not work, but that's one of the ways they're thinking about doing it. Did something happen out there? What's going on? Okay, I don't know. Um, not to worry. Anyway, so there's some kind of speculative things. Cloud gaming, we don't know if it'll work or not. Um, like Google tried to do a cloud gaming service a couple of years ago, and it wasn't a success. It didn't take off. Whether that's like an intrinsic limitation or they just didn't kind of do it right or time it right, we don't know. But you may be able to do cloud gaming, but it would, for a lot of games, it would be very dependent on being able to hide latency, and that would require these kind of local time warpy tricks or other things like that. Uh, likewise, for VR, already we use time warping in VR. The question is, could it be good enough that you could time warp over internet latencies to let you do cloud gaming in VR? And I think it's an open question that people are looking at, but that's one of the frontiers that people are uh, dealing with. So I'm not entirely sure, but I thought I would mention that stuff to bring bring us up to date. And that's actually all I've got to say about all of that. So that's the end of networking.